So the central limit theorem tells us that if x1, x2, up to xn are a sequence of independent, now it is important that they're independent, identically distributed iid, so independent, identically distributed, that just means that they all look the same. So independent, identically distributed means they all have the same shape, the same mean, and the same variance. Okay. So if you start off with a bunch of random variables that all look the same, they all have the same mean mu, variance sigma squared, then the distribution of their average is going to be approximately normal. So x bar will be approximately normal with a mean of mu and the variance is sigma squared over n. So again, coming back to our applet, let's just do that one more time. Okay, so we said we can start with absolutely any distribution I want. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to look normal. But when I look at the average, the average will look normal. The mean will be the same as the old mean. But notice my parent population from here to here is kind of spread out pretty far. But here my variance is smaller. And no matter what I started with, that's going to be true. It will look normal. The mean will be the same, but my variance, it will always be skinnier. My averages will always be skinnier. It has a smaller variance because we have to divide our variance by n. Okay, so central limit theorem, again, incredibly important. It tells you that if you take the average, it will be normally distributed with the same mean, and your variance is just divided by n. Now, it says approximately, this is only going to be a good approximation if n is at least 30. Our app will only let us go up to 25, but you can see that if I did change this, let's do a mean of like n equals 5, just so you can see. At n equals 5, this one actually still looks pretty normal, but sometimes we'll get things that don't look very normal if you only have an n of 5. That one's still not bad. I guess I really just can't think of anything that's too bad. So this one doesn't look too normal yet, but even at five, it's still a lot more normal than the original population was. But it's usually really good as long as n is at least 30. Okay. Also, if you want, so this is for the average. There's also a nice formula for sums. The sums of your IID random variables will also be approximately normal, but the mean is now going to be n times the old mean and n times the variance. So one formula for average, one formula for sums. You'll probably want to write both of those down. You'll use them both on your homework. So in this example, Let's let each of our x's be the strength of a chemical solution. It has what's called a beta distribution with a equals 18 and b equals 11. Now that doesn't actually matter to you. Those are just parameters for a beta distribution. The mean though, so the mean is 0 0.6207 and the standard deviation is 0 0.0886. And I'm probably going to need to know, so let's find the variance real quick. by squaring our standard deviation. So 0 0.00785. Okay. Now let's use our normal approximation to estimate the probability that the average of 20 of these solutions is between 0 0.6 and 0 0.65. 20 is not as high as 30, but here's what it looks like with the beta. It's not exactly symmetric, but it's pretty close to the normal distribution, right? And so for n equals 20, this will be fine. It's not unnormal enough that it's going to be a big deal. So this was our beta, and it's not quite normal, but it's really pretty close to start with. So this mean standard deviation variance and everything is for one solution xi. But we're interested in probabilities for the average of 20. So x bar will be normal. The mean for x bar is just equal to your old mean, so 0.6207. Okay. 
but your variance for x bar is equal to your old variance divided by n. So our old variance is 0 0.00785, and n is how many are you looking at? We're looking at the average of 20. So let's make a note there, n equals 20. Okay, and finally, let's find our standard deviation for x bar by the square root of that variance. So the square root of 0 0.00039 gives me 0 0.0198. So we found, we know that x bar will be normal, which means we can use our normal table. We found the mean and the standard deviation for x bar. And so now let's find our probability. So technically, this actually isn't anything new that we didn't do in section 5.2. So we learned the cool central limit theorem, but we're doing the exact same things that we're already doing. So we're looking for the probability the average is between 0.6 and 0.65. So x bar is between 0.6 and 0.65. So I'm going to need to standardize both of those, but I make sure I use the numbers that are for x bar. So we'll do 0.6 minus... 0.6207 divided by 0 0.0198. Because I was doing x bar minus the mean of x bar over standard deviation of x bar. Okay, and 0 0.65 minus 0 0.6207 over 0 0.0198. Which equals the probability that z is between negative 1.04 and 1.46. Or if I was to draw my picture, negative 1.04, 1.46, I want the area in between. So you just find each probability and subtract. Or you'll look at the CDF of 1.46 minus that CDF of negative 1.04 gives me 0.9279 minus 0.1492. So, 0.7787. So, again, I want to emphasize section 5.2, section 5.3, you're just doing the same thing. Okay, it's really just more practice. Okay, let's look at our next one. In our next example, we have a Poisson distribution. Let's see, x is our number of cracks in a ceramic tile. Here's the probability for each value. And we want to find, use the normal distribution to find the probability there are more than 750 cracks in 500 ceramic tiles. So first of all, when you look at this, this graph is just for one tile. And all of these numbers are for one tile. But we want to look at 500 tiles. So to do 500 tiles, that sounds like it would be a sum. Okay, so we'll do our sum, we'll do S for sum. It's going to be X1 plus X2 plus da da da. All the way up to 500. So you start by saying, okay, let's find our new means, variances, and standard deviations. So we told you up here some nice formulas. For the sum, your new mean will be n times your old mean, and your variance is n times your old variance. So let's use that. So it'll just be n times your old mean, so 500 times, so up here, expected value, that's mu, so 500 times 1.2 equals... 600, and the variance is supposed to be n times your old variance. So 500 times our old variance, which was also 1.2, gives me 600. And then your standard deviation for s is the square root of 600, so 24.5. So 
So once you find the new mean and standard deviation, then you go to the actual probability part. So we're looking for the probability. Let's say we want more than 750 cracks. So the probability that S is greater than 750. Now, one of the interesting things here is that this was a discrete distribution, right? For one tile, it was very discrete. Poisson is a discrete distribution, but with the central limit theorem, it says even if you start off with a discrete distribution, as long as you're looking at the average, or it turns out as well, the sum of a lot of different ones, you'll still end up at a normal distribution, even if you start off discrete. So we'll standardize, but we'll have to do S minus the mean of S over standard deviation of S. So this will be greater than 750 minus R600 divided by our standard deviation of 24.5. So this gives us the probability that Z is greater than 6.12. So here's my graph. Now 6.12, it turns out that 6.12 is way over here and I'm looking for the area to the right. And if you go to your table and you try and look up six as a Z, your table only goes up to 3.49, so six is somewhere way down here, so the area to the left must be really close to one, or the area to the right is really close to zero. So this is basically zero, it was off the charts. So basically like a zero percent chance of getting more than 750 cracks. And again, we did start with a discrete distribution, but because n was so large, we can just use our central limit theorem, and it just ends up being we can use the normal distribution that is continuous.